And I want to look today at uh, the passage you probably have heard many, many times. It's uh, Jesus is where he was tempted by Satan, led into the wilderness by the Spirit, tempted by the devil, and uh, the three temptations that he, had, uh, he was tempted in. And uh, so when you think about temptation, when you think about temptation to sin, you know it's something that you're going to go through every day. It's something that we all go through every day. Something you've gone through since you were, you know, uh, knee high to a grasshopper. And even after you were, when you were a lost person, you were tempted to sin and you sinned uh, as much as you wanted to. And when you're a saved person, you have power not to sin, but you're still tempted Day in and day out, you live in this world, you live in this flesh, you got uh, 20,000 marketing messages coming at you every day through radio, television, billboards, can't even drive down the highway without temptation coming at you in one form or another. And so when you think about temptation, you think about uh, being tempted, what what immediately pops into your mind is something about, uh, you know, maybe being tempted to uh, look at something you shouldn't look at, or maybe tempted to say something you shouldn't say, maybe tempted to uh, to do something you shouldn't do, and all those are definitely temptations. All those are temptations that you go through that we're going to go through as long as we live in a fallen world until Christ returns and makes everything new and we have a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to deal with temptation. We're going to deal with sin. Uh, there, you can be tempted in all kind of ways. You can be tempted in all kind of different things. You probably tempted with stuff that I'm not tempted with, and I'm tempted with stuff that you're not tempted with. So uh, when I say temptation is going to come uh, in various forms and various ways, for you, it's probably you know exactly what it is. I don't have to tell you what it is, and I know exactly what mine is uh, to be tempted with. But I want to show you that there's a common theme with all of our temptations, whatever it is, whether yours is food or, or something else or, or, or whatever it is that comes and tempts you. Uh, it's going to be a com- there's going to be a common theme between those things. It's going to be it's going to be the temptation to move away from God's will and to do our own will. It's going to be the temptation to what it, what, whatever it is, whatever temptation comes to you, and that's what we're going to see. That's the temptation that came to Christ. Uh, it's not that it's not that uh, you know we we just need to do this thing or do that thing, but it's going to be the temptation to do opposite of what the Father wants us to do. Opposite of what God says, this is what I want for you, this is what I want you to do, this is what I want you not to do, when we are tempted to do other than what he says to do, or what he says not to do, we are tempted to sin. Now that can come, when I say tempted to sin, you're thinking about all the evil things in the world, you're thinking about all, and all those things tempt us, all those things are real, nothing nothing wrong with those things, nothing wrong with looking at those things. But today, what I want to show you is that sometimes we're tempted to sin when it's just normal, everyday, walking around stuff. You know, God says, hey, I want you to go and I want you to, you know, be a testimony to this guy. And you're like, well, I'm kind of busy today. You know, bang, you just, you just sin. You, you were tempted. You were tempted to do what you wanted to do rather than do what God had you do. That's just an example. We do it all kind of different ways, all kind of different types all kind of different ways that we can be tempted. But every day when you're, you are tempted in your deeds, what you do, you're tempted in your thoughts and you're tempted in your speech. Understand that at the judgment, I got the chance this week to explain to someone, you know, we were talking about sin. I got, I got the chance to explain to someone that God's not only going to judge your works, your deeds that you do on this earth. He's also going to judge every thought that passes through your mind. He's going to judge every idle word that you speak. He's going to judge everything about your heart. He's going to judge everything about your mind. And that makes the whole thing just a, whole, uh, just a little bit bigger, doesn't it? It's not just about, see, the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they, were all, they thought they were all good, you know, uh, take the command for adultery, to not to commit adultery. As long as I don't go and I don't sleep with nobody, I'm good. I've, I've kept the command to commit adultery. But Jesus came along, and he made it a whole lot harder. He said, if you look at someone with lust, then you've committed adultery. So we're talking about your thought life. We're talking about the things that you, we're, we're talking about the things that you, the, that you think, the things that you say the things that pass through your mind. And to be honest with you, things flow through there all the time. Wednesday night at the youth group, when we were meeting in there, I said, what if I put a chip on you on you, and and, and I recorded all your thoughts for the whole week and I got to play them in front? Nobody wants that. I promise you, I don't want it. I guarantee you don't want it either. You don't want me to throw on the screen everything you done thought about this week. 
And I wouldn't want it either. So understand that we're not talking about mistakes and stubbing your toe and saying, darn, I really messed it up. We're talking about our hearts are rebellious against God. Our flesh wars against what God wants for you. It wars against what God has for you, who God is. And those of us who've been born again, we have a spirit inside of us, a Holy Spirit that wars against that flesh. And it's a struggle all the time. It's constantly a battle. Spirit warring against flesh. Flesh warring against spirit. And so when that temptation comes, there's something inside of me that says, hey, I want that. There's something evil, something wicked inside of me that says, that might be a pretty good idea. But those that have been born again, there's also a spirit saying, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what God's children do. That's not what the Father wants for you. That's not what Scripture says that you're supposed to do or not do. And so what we see here is we're going to see that the temptations that Jesus faced, they're the same temptations we face day in and day out. Maybe you've never been tempted to turn some stones into bread. I'm sure you haven't. If you, if you have, you know, you need to come hang out at my house. I'm spending a lot on groceries. But you have been tempted to depart from God's will. You have been tempted to move away from what God wants. You've been tempted to depart from depending on the Father and just kind of doing it yourself. That's, that's what we do. We want to just kick in the door and have it done. I want to fix it. want to have it done. want to get it done. Don't want to have to worry about it. Don't want to have to depend on anybody. I don't want nobody to say that, you know, I needed them. I want to be able to say I did it myself and I got it done myself and I don't need no help. That's what we want to do. And when we depart from God's will, when we depart from depending on him, we have walked off into sin. You, can, you, can, you better believe it. Now, Jesus here in Matthew chapter 4, he was tempted at all points, just like we are. And we're going to see today, we're going to see today that he did provide us an example of what to do when we're, temp- when we're tempted. Of course, you're gonna, you, you already know the story. He quoted scripture to Satan every time he was tempted. And so we know that that was a model for what we should do. That's an example of what we should do. But I want to show you also, that's, we're going to see that. That's no doubt that's in the text. But I want to show you there's a greater lesson at work here that what Jesus did. We're going to watch him battle Satan. We're going to watch him battle temptation. And it's not just a good example of how you should follow. It's not, a, it's not just a good, a good model for the way that we should deal with temptation, although it most certainly is. That's exactly how we should deal with temptation. That's exactly how we should deal with sin. But it's more than that. What we're going to see is we're going to see Jesus tempted at all points, just like we are, He's going to go through all the temptations that are common to man that, go, that you go through every day, every day of your life from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. You're going to be tempted with the same things that Jesus was tempted, all, albeit a little differently in a little different way. It's going to be the same temptation. The difference is, I want to ask you, how are you doing? Are you doing wonderful when you got up every time that you're tempted? Are you, uh, are, are you doing exactly what Jesus did? And not sinning and saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim the scripture, I'm going to do those things. There are times that we do it and that's what we're supposed to do and this is a model for us to do it. But the reality of what we're seeing here is that Jesus did it perfectly from the time that he was born to the time that he was crucified. And we need someone who was perfect, someone who did it perfectly to stand in for us. Because I don't know about you guys, maybe y'all are awesome, but I haven't done it perfectly. And I'm still not doing it perfectly. And so the greater lesson that we see here is that you and I, because we have been born again by the Spirit of God, we've trusted Him. If you have trusted in Him, if He is alive in your life and the Spirit is moving and growing you and you can see the evidence of the fruits of the Spirit in your life, we can rest in the fact that Jesus Christ was tempted in everything that we're going to be tempted with. And unlike us, he never sinned, not one time, kept God's law perfectly. And we're going to see that as he defeats Satan right here when Satan comes and brings him these temptations. So the the greater lesson I want you to see here is not just that Jesus provides us a model and an example of how we are to deal with temptations. 
that's in there. It's, it's no doubt. That is how we're supposed to do it. And he is a model, and we are supposed to model, and we do model ourselves after the way Christ lived. But the greater example, the greater lesson here is the gospel. You see, Jesus gave us his perfect life. It was like I had two books the other night. I wish I had another book. I got a Bible, and I got, I got this paper. I'll use that. It was like this. The, it's two books. Just pretend this is a book. Two books. This is the book of Christ's life. You flip through it. Okay, he was born in Bethlehem. He never sinned. He did. It's just goodness. Goodness, goodness, perfection, righteousness, never broke the law. And then you got my book. You flip through my book and my life and you say, whoa, you messed up that day and this day and that day and pretty much every day. Well, what, what have you been doing? You flip the pages and it's just sin, sin, sin over and over again. And so what happens is Christ, whose book is perfection, Mine is anything but perfection, probably the polar opposite from perfection. What happens is when I trust in Jesus as my Savior, my Lord, when I give him my heart, when I open myself and sign the title deed of my life over to him, he takes my book and he nails it to the cross and that punishment is laid upon Jesus. So the Father looks down at Jesus and he sees, wow, you messed up on this day and that day and that day because he's reading my book. He's reading my account of my life. And then when I stand before the judgment, he looks at me and he looks at my life and he opens my book and says, wow, you never sinned. You didn't sin on this day. You you was perfect the whole life. And the reason why is because I have been united with Christ and his book is now my book. And my book was put on him and all the wrath of the Father, all the wrath of God was poured out upon him because he took my book. He took my sin. He took all the things that I did. So what I want you to see here today is we're not just, I'm not just giving you a good lesson about how to live. I'm showing you the reality of how perfect your Savior is and how much you need him. Okay? So I want you to see that. Jesus did here in Matthew chapter 4. We're only going to read like maybe 10 verses. But Jesus did here in Matthew chapter 4 what God's people have never done could never do. He lived perfectly. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, and he lived perfectly. Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness being tempted, and they screwed it up every day. They messed it up. They they didn't survive one temptation without falling into sin. And so, and, and the fact that That Jesus is, he is the perfect Israel. He is the perfect people of God. He's the perfect representation. He even quotes, the three scriptures he's going to quote here are from Deuteronomy 6 through 8, which is the part of Deuteronomy that talks about Israel wandering in the wilderness. And so he is fulfilling what no one else could do. He's fulfilling what the Son of God was come to do, and he is our righteousness. So that's a big, long introduction. Let Let me go ahead and start reading. We're going to look at his temptations. It says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Notice that the devil just didn't grab a hold of him and said, Okay, boy, you're coming with me. It was the Spirit of God that led him into the wilderness and allowed the devil to tempt him. The devil didn't have no power to come to Jesus that the Spirit didn't, uh, didn't allow him to do so. And he was allowed to do so so Jesus could demonstrate his perfection. He could demonstrate his righteousness and thereby become a sacrifice for us. It said he was led into the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. He was a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, look at the temptation. God, Jesus was all God. He was, all, he was the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Perfect. Divine. But then again, he was also all man. 100% human. He wasn't 50% God, 50% man. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. 
And so when Jesus fasted, he was preparing himself. This was right before he would start his ministry. He would go out public and, and, and start healing and, and preaching and doing those things. And so as he, he was preparing himself for that, he was fasting in the wilderness. He was more than likely praying to the Father. He was getting himself ready to do this ministry. And Satan comes in the midst of all this. Jesus was hungry. He'd been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Satan comes and he said, if you're the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And so what he was saying, he said, if you read the chapter before this, he had, Jesus had just gotten baptized by John the Baptist. And when Jesus came up out of the water, you know what happened? The, the clouds opened, the heavens opened, and uh, uh, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And he heard the voice of his father, and his father said what? This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And now here comes the devil going, well, look, if you're really God's son, If you're really God's son, you don't deserve to be hungry. You don't have to go through this suffering. You don't have to do these things. You have power, man. You've got the power to turn stones into bread. You can feed yourself. You don't have to wait on your father. You don't have to wait on him to provide for you. You don't have to depend on him. You can do it yourself the temptation was not there's nowhere in scripture that i can find where it says thou shalt not turn stones into bread that wasn't the temptation the temptation was you can step out from under the father's will you're here fasting you're here praying you're here preparing yourself to do your ministry to do your service to do what you came to do here on this earth You don't deserve to sit here and be hungry and to be starving and to be uncomfortable. You're the son of God, man. You can can turn stones to bread yourself. You can step out from under your father's will and just do it. You don't have to wait on him. And Jesus answered him and he said, he said, uh, he said, uh, where where am I? Verse four. He said, but he answered him. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, what he did was he said, Jesus did what so often we don't do. He denied himself in order to to trust and that his father would provide. He basically said, he quoted Deuteronomy, it's Deuteronomy 8.3. I want to read that verse to you just a second. But he basically said, if I have God's word, And if I have my father watching over me, I don't need food. I don't live by bread alone. I don't survive by bread alone. I don't don't find my satisfaction out of food, out of of hunger, out of of bread, out of of, uh, satisfying my own needs. My satisfaction comes from obeying my father, from, from submitting to my father, denying myself, and trusting in him when he's ready to feed me he's going to feed me and you'll see at the end of this when satan leaves it says angels came and ministered to him he says when when the father's ready for me to have he's going to give it to me but until then i was led by the spirit to come here i was led by the spirit to come into the wilderness I was led by the Spirit to fast and pray to prepare for the the three years, three and a half years of ministry, the death I would die. I was led by the Spirit to do this. And so God has a purpose for me. Man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word of God. Let me just read to you. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. You don't have to turn there. Let me just read it to you. Listen to what he says. He says... This is Moses speaking, and this is the verse that Jesus quote, uh, quoted. And Moses is talking about their wandering in the wilderness. In verse 3 in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, Moses says to the people, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. He says, And he humbled, oh, there it is. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. And this is why he did it. Look that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Why did he suffer him to hunger, the, the Israelites in the wilderness? 
He suffered them to hunger. He said, you need to be hungry. You need to go through this. You need to be hungry, and I'm going to feed you with bread from heaven. I'm going to feed you with manna that comes down from the sky. And why did he do that? Because I want you to see that you are not going to live just by bread alone. You're not going to be satisfied just by bread alone. You are only going to be satisfied by the word of the living God. I'm going to provide your every need according to my riches and glory. I'm going to give you everything that you need for life and godliness. I'm going to give you everything that you need to live. And all you have to do is deny yourself, take up your cross, submit yourself to me and and trust in me. It's as simple as that. All you have to do is trust in me. And that's what Jesus was doing as he was in the wilderness. And Satan came, came along and he said, you don't have to do that. God's, it was the same thing Satan said in the garden. God don't want you to be happy. God don't want to take care of you. God's just afraid, he told Adam and Eve. God's just afraid you're going to be like him. He's trying to keep something from you. He's trying to keep all this goodness from you. And that's the same thing he was doing with Jesus. And so often he does that to us as well. You ever felt like that? You ever thought like that? Man, I don't deserve this. I'm a good person. I, I do all kinds of stuff. Why is this happening to me? I, don't, I, I shouldn't have to go through this. And instead of understanding that God is leading and guiding you, if you're his child, if you're a Christian, God's leading and guiding you in everything. Instead, we try to kick the door. I know I do anyway. I try to kick the door open. I try to figure a way around. You know, I, I want to get out of this deal. Rather than saying, God, what is it that you want me to learn here? What is it you're trying to teach me? What is it that you're doing in my life? I just want out. I just want out of the mousetrap. You know, I, I want the cheese and I want to get out of the mousetrap. So the first temptation was not just, hey, man, if you're hungry, just, just turn some stones to bread. The first temptation was you can step out from under your father's will. You can step out from what your father has said that you should do. The Spirit led you here. The Spirit led you to the wilderness. The Spirit wants you to fast and pray. You know, you're all human, so you're hungry, and you're preparing yourself by, uh, by, by praying to the Father and getting yourself ready for the, the ministry that's going to be, you know, yours for the next three and a half years. But you're the Son of God. Gee, the Father just said, that you're the son of God and that he's well pleased with you just in the chapter before this. If you're the son of God, why don't you use that power? Why don't you use that power? Don't worry about submitting to your father. Don't worry about all that stuff. Just just do what you do. I mean, you're the son of God. Change those stones to bread. Jesus said, I refuse. Now, could Jesus have changed the stone to bread? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He could have he could have blinked and it would have become bread. He could have changed the stones into a, a McCheeseburger or whatever if he wanted to. He could have done whatever he wanted to, but he refused to step out from under the will of his father. He submitted to his father at every point. And you know why he did that? Because you and I wouldn't. He was uniting himself to us, to his people. And so when, when, when we stand before God, we can say, when we stand before God at the judgment, we can say, he'll say, you know, why should, why should I let you in heaven? You've done all kinds of stuff. Jesus Christ lived perfectly before you, and his death is my death. His life is my life. His resurrection is my resurrection. And I stand before you, not in my own life that I lived, but in the perfect life that Jesus lived for you. He could have done anything. He could have called 12,000 angels. Listen, at the end of this temptation, at the end of these three temptations, Jesus is going to command Satan to leave. He's going to command Satan to leave, and the angels are going to come minister him. He could have commanded Satan to leave right here. He didn't have to quote Deuteronomy 8.3. He could have said, Satan, get out of here. And it was, he would have been gone. It would have been over. Why did he suffer it to happen? Why did he allow it to go on? Because he was going to live righteously because you and I can't. Because you and I haven't. And he was going to defeat the same temptations that you and I go through so that he could stand in our place before the Father and say, I did what they couldn't do. I paid the price that they couldn't pay. So let's look at the next one. It says, verse 5 says, <clears throat> Then the devil, okay, the devil takes him up into the, 
the holy city, said of him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil says, Oh, okay, you want to trust God's word? Okay, well, let's trust God's word. And so he takes Jesus all the way up to the pinnacle of the temple. That's the very highest point of the temple. And he says, throw yourself off. If, you, if you're God's son, okay, he, he, he failed the first time. The devil failed the first time. He says, so all right, you're saying that you're, you'd rather trust God's word than just feed yourself. You'd rather submit to your father. Okay, fine. Let's submit to God. Let's trust God's word. He takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and he quotes Psalm 91. I'm not going to read it to you, but that's what it is. It's Psalm 91. But the problem is he quotes it way out of context. Psalm 91, what, that, what he says there, he is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Psalm 91 is written to show us, to show the reader, to show uh, the world that God will protect his children when enemies surround him. When enemies come and there is, there is death and destruction and evil and all kind of things are around them, you, you probably, a lot of people in the army, a lot of people in the military service quote Psalm 91 and memorize Psalm 91. I know when my brother went to Afghanistan or uh, they, he, they, he and my mother memorized Psalm 91. That's the one where it says, you know, uh, 10,000 will fall on your left and how many ever thousand on your right, but it won't touch you. That's that Psalm. And so it was written... And its purpose is to give you comfort when enemies are surrounding you and you don't know where to turn and there's no way out. God is going to protect you. It was not meant to say, go throw yourself into danger and see if God will pull you out of it. That's not what it was meant for. It was meant to show you when enemies are around you, God will protect you. But what Satan was telling Jesus was, Put yourself in danger. Put yourself in the Do you notice that he said, uh, I, I, my favorite little part of the verse is where he said, throw yourself down. It was like the devil didn't have no power to push him off. He didn't have no power to do nothing but sit there and whisper in his ear. If, if the only thing that you can do as a child of God, someone with the spirit of God living in, the only thing that you can do is what, what, is what you allow him to do. He'll say in your ear, throw yourself down. You say, okay, woo. Just because you chose to do that. He don't have power to push you off. He don't have power to do none of that. He said, throw yourself down and let's see if God's word's true. Let's see how, let's see how you trust. You trust God's word. You don't want to turn stones to bread. Well, let's really trust God's word. And Jesus answered him and he quoted another section from Deuteronomy. I'm not going to go read it, but it says, uh, it says, Jesus said to him, verse seven, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord God. That word tempt also means test. It's like, we're, you're, not, you're not getting me to test God just to see where it's true. It's the difference between, it's the difference between having faith in God and saying, well, I'm not going to believe until you actually do something for me. That's the difference between faith and not faith. I, I, I do, Dana and I sometimes do like financial counseling with people that want to get on budgets and, and, and that kind of stuff. And I remember this has been years ago, but I remember the, this, this verse brought it to my mind. The, the, this couple came and you know, they wanted to get all their stuff together and everything. And we often talk about tithing. We often talk about, you know, God says that, uh, you know, um, shaking down, but what is it? Yeah, uh, yeah. If you, you give to him and he'll give to you, what's the first part of that verse? I don't remember. It's, uh, you ain't going to help me, Johnny. Say, it, huh? Yeah, it's that pressed down, men shall give to your bosom. Anyway, you can't, have, what it's saying is you give to God, God's going to make sure that you're okay. God's going to make sure men give to you. He's going to be pressed down, shaken over, men shall give to your bosom and all that. And that's one of the things that we talk about. When we get new, if, we're gonna, if you're going to come to my house and you're going to get us to set you up on a budget, you're going to have a category in your budget for tithing. And if you don't have a category in your budget for tithing, you refuse to have a category in your budget for tithing, you're not going to get no help from me because you, you, you already jacking up your budget from the very beginning, you know. And so that was one of the things that we do. But this person said to me, said to me, and it was like, she, she said, 
this was the wife, she said, now, we tried that giving the 10% and it didn't work. <laughs> and I was like, but do you see what you did? I mean, you put yourself into this financial situation and then now you're going to test God to see if he's going to do what he said. He was. It, it, it's a difference between trusting God and saying, look, I'm giving my money. I'm giving my tithe, you know, come hell or high water. I don't care what. That's trusting God. But this, I, I went out and bought a new bass boat and got a house way too big for my budget and, and bought all this stuff and got, you know, $30,000 worth of credit card debt. You get yourself in that situation and then you say, I better start tithing so God will fix all this. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you're testing God. You're not putting faith in God. You're not trusting God. You know, you're te- that's what he was telling Jesus. He was like, God said, the Father said he would protect you. When enemies surround you. So jump off the temple and let's see if it's true. Jesus like, that's not what that verse is about. He said, uh, this is just my imagination, but I'm thinking he's like, you wait till I get on that cross. You wait till I get on that cross and all my enemies around me and I'm I'm, I'm on trial. People are slapping me in the face and pulling my beard out and whipping me across my back. I guarantee you Psalm 91 will be true. It'll be true for me then. Enemies surround me, and God's going to protect me. He's going to lift me up. He's going he's to make sure that I'm taken care of. Uh, I don't need to jump off the temple here. I don't need to throw myself down. I don't need to check and see if it's true. I know it's true because I believe and I have faith in God. And so what he's doing here is he's trusting. He's trusting his Father. He's trusting the Word of God. And it's, he's doing it not just, it is a model for this is what you're supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. But Jesus is winning the battle right here. He's fighting the battle for you and me right here. He's winning. He is destroying everything that the devil throws at him. And he's doing so, so he could stand before the Father and say, I live perfectly so this, this, this man here can get into heaven. This man here can come into, into your presence. This woman here can come into your presence because I did it. I beat him. I beat him in the wilderness. I lived perfectly. I never sinned. I never did anything that, that stepped out from under the Father's will. And so it says in the, in the, the last temptation, and then we'll go, it says, uh, verse 8, devil failed twice. Again, the devil taketh him into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if you will fall down and worship me. Now, this temptation, it's this temptation more than any others really spoke to me when I was reading and praying and studying over this. Because the Father, listen to this now, the Father has already promised all the kingdoms of the world to the Messiah. In Psalm 2, He said, I will give you, he's talking about the Messiah, talking about this son that will come. I will give you the kingdoms of the earth and you'll rule them with a rod of iron. And it goes on and on and on. The father had already promised Jesus that all the kingdoms, he would rule and reign. And when he ascended to the father, he said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All the kingdoms are his. And so... What Satan was offering him here, what did, what did he have to do, though, before God, the Father, would give him these kingdoms? He had to suffer. He had to have a lash on his back. He had to go to the cross. He had to be humiliated. He had to be stripped and, and beaten by the people he himself created. He had to do all these things. He knew from the very first part of the gospel... All the way to the crucifixion, Jesus knew why he was there. He told his disciples over and over again, the Son of Man's got to be turned over to the Gentiles. He's got to be killed. He's got to be beaten. And then on the third day, he's going to rise. He knew that was coming. He knew that was the purpose of why he was born. And here, Satan wasn't just offering him. And we can debate about whether Satan actually had the power to give him the kingdoms of Noah. You know, whether he did or whether he didn't, he stole that power from it anyway. But if, even if he didn't, what he's offering Jesus here is a way around the suffering. You see? Even if he didn't have the power to give it to him. He's saying, you know what? The kingdoms are going to be yours. The Father has promised you the kingdoms. But you're going to have to suffer. 
You're going to have to go to the cross. You're going to have to be humiliated and spit on and, and beaten and all these things. I can give them to you right now. I can give them to you right now and you won't have to suffer. You won't have to be humiliated. You won't have to go through any of this stuff. The only thing you have to do is bow down and worship me. That's right. And so he says, he says, Jesus answered again with scripture. And he says, where am I at? 10. Then Jesus said unto him, this is where he commands them to leave. He says, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shall thou serve. And then what happened in verse 11, that's the last verse we'll read. When, when Jesus said, get thee hence, he says, then the devil left him. Then the devil leave him. And then behold, the, the angels came and ministered unto him. So what you see here is, what you see here in this final temptation is the same thing that you're going to be tempted with. Step out from God's will. You can't be happy unless you're doing the things the world does, being like the world. You can't be happy. You are, you're, what are you suffering for? What are you, go, what are you putting yourself through all this for? What do you, what do you, look at all the stuff you're missing out on. You know, of course, we know we're not missing out on nothing, but look at, this is what the world's telling us. Look at all this that you can, you can have. You can do, eh, it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to do anything. It, the temptation, all three tem- temptations are the same. And it's the same thing, no matter what temptation you face, no matter what your thing is, it's the same temptation. Step out from under God's will. Don't worry about submitting yourself to the Father. Don't, when he says, when he says, when he commands you to come and fellowship with the brethren, yeah, you know what, it's, why would I put myself through that? Why would I put myself through that? I could stay home and everything will be fine. When he says, don't do this, when he says, don't uh, uh, dwell on, on these kind of thoughts, you know, well, well, I'm just, I'm only a man. I mean, I... I, surely everybody else, I'm doing better than Joey is down the road. At least I'm not that bad. The temptation is to step out and say, you know what? I'm not going to submit to the Father. I'm not going to submit to God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to believe in this man named Jesus just so I got my ticket punch and I'm ready to go to heaven. But you know what? When it comes down to actually walking the walk on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, I, you probably won't be able to tell much difference than me, than them. So what Jesus did here, as we close, is Jesus definitely gave us a model of how we are to deal with temptation. By the word of God. It's as simple as that. The word says it. No matter if you believe it or not, it's true. That's what we're supposed to live by. The, the world says, well, you got the, uh, if the Bible says yes, it's yes. If the Bible says no, it's no, period. End of discussion. There's n- no reason to go back and forth, no reason to weigh it in your mind. I used to do this thing where while I'm making decisions, I would write out all the pros and write out all the cons. No sense in doing it. Bible says no, the answer is no, period. End of discussion. But more than that, Jesus was living righteously and defeating Satan, tempted at, in all points as we are, yet, unlike us, he was without sin. And what we see here is the demonstration of his righteousness. So when I stand before God as a person who's trusted in Christ, not for any of my own goodness, not because I'm so awesome or anything, but just because I've trusted in him by grace through faith, when I stand before him, Jesus never sinned he never succumbed to temptation he always did what his father commanded him to do and he, because of that he can stand in my place at the judgment and say i did it for him and god the father can look at my book like i showed you he can look at my book and all he'll see is wow you did good because it wasn't me doing good it was his son doing good. The books have been changed. He, he, the account of his life is on my account. And all of my life, my sin, my wretchedness went on to him. And the father poured out his wrath on the cross. How are you doing? 
See, that's the thing. If you're going to be right with the Father, if you're going to go to heaven when you die, however you want to put it, if you're going to be righteous in His sight, one of two things has got to happen. Either you are going to be absolutely 100% perfect, no spot, no blemish, never in your life succumbed to temptation, never in your life gave in to sin, never in your life gave in to what Satan would come and whisper in your ear, never. And I'm not talking about starting today. I'm not talking about walking out the door and saying, you know what, he's right, I'm going to do better. I'm never going to do that again. No, no, I'm talking about all them years before today. All of them have to be perfect too. Got to be perfect from beginning to end. You're either going to have to be 100% perfect not 99.8, not 99.9, not 99.99999. You're going to have to be 100% absolutely perfect, never failed when it came to following God, trusting God, obeying God, 100% perfect. And if that's you, pleased to meet you. You're the first one I've ever met. Or you're going to have to trust in Jesus and give him your life. Because he most certainly did, 100%. Never failed, never faltered, never stepped out from under God's will, the Father's will, never ever uh, succumbed to temptation, never sinned, not even one time, not even a hint of sin. And when he stands, when, when he strolled back into the heaven's courtroom after he ascended to the Father, he sat down at the right hand of power and the Father could look at him and say, this is my son, and I am pleased with him. I'm pleased with him because he's perfect. He never sinned. He kept the law perfectly. He did everything that my word commands, that his word commands, should be done. So you're either going to have to be perfect, or you're going to have to have a substitute for you that was perfect. Fortunately for you today, there is one. But there is only one. Nobody else ever offered to be your substitute. Nobody else ever lived a perfect life so they could be your substitute. The only substitute that is offered, the only door that there is for you to walk through, the only way that you can come to the Father, the only life that there is is in Jesus. And so today you're going to have to trust in Him. You're going to have to give Him your heart. You're going to have to repent of your sin. You're going to have to give Him your life. Because if you don't, the weight of God's anger against sin is going to fall on you. Somebody's going to pay for your sin. It's either going to be you paying eternally in the fires of hell, or it's going to be Jesus who paid perfectly at the cross of Calvary. So today, man, if, you, if I even thought that there might be a chance that, that I didn't know Christ, or more importantly, that Christ didn't know me. I would make sure I got it right. Trust Him today because I promise you, although you may not know it, you need Him today. But, but I promise you there's going to come a day when you're going to bad need Him. When you stand before the Father. You're going to need a substitute. You're going to need perfection. You're going to need righteousness. And He did it. He did it perfectly over and over again. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We come before you today and we 